If you have a wound here that's colonized and you go septic and your antibiotics are not working because this wound here, as it's colonizing and sending out the pathogens, they have developed a biofilm around themselves, making it antibiotic resistant. And so when Manuka honey, when the right level of Manuka honey, the right appropriately graded medicinal Manuka honey is applied to the colonization site, even though you're septic, throughout your entire body, suddenly your own body can get ahead of that infection because it inhibits the pathogen's ability to create a biofilm around itself and you, your antibiotics will start working, your own body will start being effective, your own immune system. And so it just needs to apply, be applied to where you're colonizing. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Wendy Myers. Welcome to the Myers Detox Podcast. Today we have Joyce Dales on the show and she's gonna be talking about the booger biome. She's gonna be talking about all the different ways that uh, bacteria and viruses and pathogens colonize in our, our nasal passages. That's where the kind of the first point of entry. She's gonna talk, talk about why we get sick and how we get sick. She's gonna talk about why 25% of hospital workers have MRSA bacteria colonized in their nasal patches, passages and what they do that uh, to try to clear that up. And we're gonna talk about Joyce's product called Cold Be Gone that she spent two years developing and how that uses this nasal swab to help to clear pathogens from the, from the, the nasal biome, the booger biome, and but also at the same time helping to keep your nasal, you know, your good bacteria, your positive nasal biome intact. And a really, really interesting show. We do a deep dive into Manuka honey and different medicinal honeys from around the world. Really, really interesting show. You want to tune in. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy right now. I just got back from 10 days in Costa Rica and I was there because I was celebrating my 50th birthday. <laughs> my birthday is on August 5th. So I was born August 5th, 1972 and I'm a Leo. And I just wanted to be deep in the rainforest uh, of Costa Rica for my birthday. And uh, ha I just had an amazing time. I was hanging out with, you know, wild scarlet macaws and anteaters and someone at my hotel saw a little cat called the Margay. And I saw, um, God, all, kind, all kinds of monkeys and possums and just amazing animals hiking through the rainforest. It was just, it was fantastic. And I also went all over Costa Rica as well. I was in almost every corner of Costa Rica. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I had a fantastic time. So just want to let you guys know that 50, I, I really never thought that he would be this good. Um, I never really, uh, I never really imagined that I would be like this happy and feel this good at 50. And you know, when you're like in your twenties and thirties, you think, oh, 50, you're, you're, I don't want to say your life's over, but you don't really have a very good prognosis for yourself, I think, when you're younger. Um, but I assure you, you know, if you take care of yourself, if you focus on your health and prioritize your health, like I did, I prioritized sleep, I've always prioritized eating really healthy, then at a certain point I was prioritizing uh, detoxification. Now I focus much more on emotional detox as well, and you know, getting rid of negative emotions and emotional trauma in my new emotional detox program. You can check that out at emo-detox.com, E-M-O-detox.com. I have a free masterclass that you can check out there talking about the physical impact of emotional trauma, it's super interesting. So just focusing on all these things, I think has helped uh, keep me very youthful feeling and youthful looking, even though I'm 50. And then I'm gonna be bringing a lot of anti-aging content to you guys over the next couple of years. That's gonna be my focus is, is anti-aging. So so tune in for that, you guys. So uh, back to the, the show here. So Joyce Dale, she's the CEO of Buzzagogo, and she's the inventor of Colby Gone, which is a homeopathic Manuka honey-based remedy that you swab in your nose to fight cold, flu, allergies, and to protect the nasal biome. So Joyce used to be a high school teacher, uh, and she's married to Jeffrey, who's a so an attorney and a software engineer. 
And in 2009 and 2011, they welcomed two beautiful girls uh, that they grew their family through the gift of international adoption. And together, her, uh, her and her husband run their company while homeschooling as they travel the country in their 1972 Airstream, same age as me. So Colby Gone is now sold nationwide, and it's also the proud official sponsor of the Boston Red Sox. So you can check out her company at coldbegone.com. It's C-O-L-D-B-E-E, like a B, buzzing B, gone.com. Joyce, thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and, and how you got into the health industry? I was originally a school teacher. And that's what I thought I was going to be my entire life. And when I met my husband, um, we decided to start our family through adoption and international adoption to be specific. And when we brought our little girl home, she uh, was sick. She needed emergency open heart surgery. And so that sort of thrust me into the world of alternative medicine abruptly because I had to think about how to keep her healthy in ways that were outside of the traditional, outside of what we usually think of with regards to healthcare. I wanted to think of ways to, to help keep her safe. And so that is how I wound up in this space accidentally. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's just sounds like just such a harrowing, harrowing ordeal to, to have to, to deal with that and, and very scary at the same time. And so was, um, was there anything going on with her immune system? Was she immunocompromised? Mm-hmm. You, you really got into like looking at the, the human biome, right? Right. So I guess I should back up a little bit. It wasn't the first time I'd had immunocompromised loved one. Just before we brought her home for her adoption, um, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer in the previous five years from working with asbestos during the Korean War. And so he was the first loved one I'd had that was called immunocompromised. And I know we've all, we're all really familiar with that phrase, but I'll tell you 15 years ago, that was a new word in my world. And so when she was coming, he had passed away and then we started our adoption for her. And in the middle of our adoption, um, well, in the middle of getting her referral, which is what they call it when you get your baby's first picture. So we got our referral and it was a healthy baby girl from Vietnam. She was six months old at time of referral. Within a few weeks, we got a notification that she was very sick in Vietnam and they thought it was pneumonia. Now, granted, she's in a rural part of of Vietnam. She's in an orphanage. You know, we don't know the conditions she's being kept in. So she had pneumonia. So they were going to transport her to the Hanoi Child Swedish Pediatric Hospital in Hanoi, which was built during the Vietnam War. So we're like, okay, all right, this is scary, but it's 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 what happens when you work through international adoption. Things can happen. Well, within three days, it went from she has pneumonia to she needs something's wrong with her heart to she needs emergency open heart surgery right now. So we found out at 3 a.m. from a doctor speaking very broken English that she had a a defect that caused her heart to be completely backwards and that the blood was going to her lungs um, too frequently and it was causing pulmonary hypertension and that she had made it to eight months old without this being detected because most children are found within the first 48 hours of life and require emergency intervention. She made it to eight months old in this rural Vietnamese orphanage because she had a huge atrial septic defect that was helping her body compensate. And with that, it had grown all this tissue off the back of her heart. And so when they did her emergency open heart surgery, they had to give her a full pulmonary graft. And her pulmonary graft was done entirely out of that excess tissue, her own tissue. So she wound up having the most perfect correction that you could ever hope for, for one of the most serious heart defects that a child can be born with. So when we spoke with our doctors here, just before she came home, they said, you know, if we have this specific situation, we send this child to San Francisco or Boston, this child has to go someplace where there are specialists who can handle this. And it's very rare that we encounter it. In Vietnam, they were doing 20 a month. So that's another reason her correction was so perfect was because they were so familiar with this. And then that's when we found out this is an Agent Orange legacy defect that there generations of children, congenital heart defects are the most common birth defects in the world. And 
her defect was so common there that that they were doing surgeries constantly, but, but they're farming the soil. And Agent Orange is a forever chemical. It's never going anywhere unless they scrape the earth there and remove two feet of topsoil for them to continue gardening. So yeah. generations upon generations, this will just keep going on and on and on. Oh. So yeah, I know. so she was it's, one of the lucky ones. My, yeah. my uncle was in Vietnam and he has a brain tumor that he's dealing with uh, from Agent Orange as well. And it's a huge problem. I'm sorry. The forever chemical. So people who think glyphosate isn't a forever chemical or isn't going to affect generations of human beings, they're wrong. Asbestos was affecting my father 50 years later. Agent Orange is affecting my daughter three generations later. So it just, it never goes away. So, and I think it's great that you developed this product called Cold Be Gone uh, to help people with just the simple common cold, you know, because it's just uh, something that afflicts all of us and we have to deal with this. And so, and what got, so, so you, you discovered like the booger biome. So, <laughs> so what is that exactly? And, and why did you develop the, the, your Cold Be Gone product to, to help with the, the booger biome? Well, it goes back to being on a plane on my way to Vietnam. I'm on my way to Vietnam. And at that time, uh, there was another nasal, I won't name it, another nasal swab product, the only other nasal swab product that any of us knew back then. And it was right the week we went to leave. I was a school teacher at the time. I was like, oh, I need to protect myself from colds. So I had this like false idea that this was going to protect me from these germs on the plane, five planes to Vietnam and, and the crazy environmental change and all those things. And it got pulled from the market for causing loss of sense of smell. So I knew I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. So I started researching just, just out of curiosity. Why the nose? Why was that happening? All of that. So then we get our baby girl home and we find out she's immunocompromised. All international adoptions, uh, adoptees are considered immunocompromised because it's a huge change in diet. It's a huge change in environment, blah, blah, blah. So plus, never mind, she's recovering from open heart surgery at this point. So when she was deemed immunocompromised and it was the second time someone I loved was called that, I was like, okay, I want to think about how we get sick. What can I do? I can do something about cold and flu and beyond the traditional ways you think about preventing cold and flu, washing hands, all of that. I took what I had been researching about the nose and I learned what we've all learned in the last two years all viruses start here, like 99% of them colonize right here. And I was fascinated by this. I'm like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Then I learned that viruses remain dormant. when. So if you touch your eyes, ears, nose, or mouth, the virus or the pathogen will travel to the nasal mucosa, the upper adenoid zone in the upper part of your nose and the higher part of the back of your throat whether you have adenoids or not. And then it will latch on there and remain dormant for one to 14 days, depending on the variety of pathogen. Then it will pass its code onto your cells and trick your cells into replicating that code millions of times over. And when that process starts within one to four hours, you can have millions of replications. And that's when you'll feel the thing in your throat or the tickle, whatever your first tell is that something's going on, you're starting to get sick. So I was fascinated by that dormancy phase and all of that. So put that aside, I have my baby girl, I've been researching the nose just out of being nosy. And I've always been a lifelong apotherapist. Then I start learning about the nasal biome and that your nose is supposed to be full of beneficial bacteria. It's the first line of defense to your immune system and it's designed to trap and prevent. So I'm taking all these pieces together like a completely stubborn mom who's determined that I'm going to protect my kid no matter what. Don't tell me there's no way to prevent a cold. I'm going to figure it out, right? That's, that was my attitude. And I thought about it and I thought, well, why can't we impact? Why isn't there some product that can impact pathogens while they are latched on so that it can interrupt the colonization process before it really gets going. So I spoke with a lot of doctors during this phase, the international doctors we were working with and everybody. And I asked them about, one of them was talking about MRSA colonization. And that's how we, he related this to me. When um, medical personnel in the medical field are colonized with MRSA, they are colonized here. And like 25% of all medical personnel are perpetually colonized with VRE or MRSA and that's how it gets spread. But in order to deal with somebody who has a really persistent colonization that's antibiotic resistant, they would offer the medical personnel ampules of alcohol that were designed that they would burst and it would sterilize the entire nose in the hopes of ending the MRSA colonization in the nasal pharynx. 
But in doing so, they, they, he was very cautionary. He's like, well, when you do that, you can create an antibiotic resistant strain that's worse, or you can completely sterilize your nasal biome. And then that person becomes susceptible to new infections a day later, a week later, a month later, because you've destroyed all the beneficial bacteria that the nasal mucosa relies upon for trapping and preventing. This was just just fascinating to me. So that's, that was the start of my understanding of the booger biome and how critical it is to our health. And I took all of those pieces together and I began to think about it. Okay. How can we impact this replication colonization phase, but do it without carpet bombing the entire area and opening yourself up to worse risk of sinusitis or infection or anything. And for me, that was apotherapy. Because another part of my life at that time, I was obsessively researching super honeys because Manuka honey had just come on the scene. I'm one of those people like my hobbies are to obsessively research things that are obscure that other people are not into at the moment. That's my superpower. So I I was researching honey and I wasn't just doing it like casually reading on the internet. I was reaching out to the original researcher who discovered Manuka honey. And I was like emailing him on a weekly basis. Oh, wow. Tell me more. <laughs> I know I wrote one of my first articles on Manuka honey. I spent like three weeks researching it. It's, it's fascinating. And it's just, it's an amazing product. It is amazing. It is amazing. And I was researching it because we'd had a MRSA in the family that had resulted in a uh, hospitalization and, and it was serious. So that all these little things synergistically happened all around my daughter coming home in that three-year phase where I was like, all of this information came to me at once. So anyway, I was reaching out to Dr. Peter Mullen at University of Waikido about Manuka honey, like on a weekly basis. And the man was so kind and so patient. And he gave me a download on everything there is to know about not just Manuka honey, but super honeys in general. There's many of them around the world. I'm sure we have some in the United States we just have not identified yet. But no two super honeys function in the exact same way. Manuka honey functions by a unique Manuka factor, which is the UMF rating. And you want to be in the 12 to 16 range for it to be truly antimicrobial. And then he told me that anything above 16, when you see Manuka honey, that's rated 18 or 20, that that's not, a, it's a dangerous rating because that honey may have been warehoused and heated to falsely inflate the methyl glyoxal, which can cause a bee allergy in a non bee allergic person. So I'm, I'm taking all this information in and, and I, I called um, some other people to learn about Scottish Highland, Brazilian Red, all of these amazing super honeys around the world. And I started tinkering with them in my kitchen. And that is how I came up with Colby It took two years of nonstop trial and error because honey is just not created equal. There's so many different, you can respond so differently to different honeys and also the seasonality and the weather and the, all kinds of things can impact how, how it's workable um, or how it feels. So it took me a couple of years and I finally came up with a consistency that I could do batch after batch. And then people, I would give it to people in mason jars. I'd be like, stick this up your nose, stick this up your nose. And I would tell people your booger biome, it's, I promise it's a real thing. People thought I was crazy. Now if post COVID, I could say it to anybody and they'd be like, oh yeah. So I was giving it to everyone I know and I was getting amazing feedback. And I thought I was just going to sell it at farmer's markets. Like I was going to be that lady, the, the honeybee lady at the little New Hampshire farm, mar, farmer's market. And my husband, who's a, an attorney was like, no, that's a medicine. You can't do that. That's, that's illegal. So then we had to start on the path of how do you become a medicine? And that if I'd known how hard that was going to be, I don't know that I would have done it. Well, I'm glad that you did because you're in stores across the country in the United States. I mean, you can go into any drugstore and find a Colby gun. Yep. We're everywhere now. We got picked up by CVS and all these different places. And uh, we just got picked up my, my favorite new placement. I have two Army Air Force Exchange, because when families are abroad, they cannot shop for their OTCs off base. So there's not a lot of natural options for those moms, those families with their kids who are stationed abroad. So that was exciting because that puts me in a bunch of different countries accessible to U.S. service people. And then the other one, which was so strange, was I got into travel centers of America all over the United States, roadside travel place. And I was amazed at how well we sell there because moms on the go, sniffles truckers on the go. They, they want everything they need right there. They don't want to, they can't drive their trucks just anywhere. 
And when they're sick, they want a solution. So, and a natural solution, which is really new. There's, there's been a shift in attitude about looking for something to protect you beyond take it to the next level and something natural because most every other nasal product that I've ever found has sodium benzoate chemicals, alcohol, glycerin, something to make it the viscosity of a spray or a gel. Every one of those things completely sterilizes your nasal biome or stuns your cilia and paralyzes your nose's ability to trap and prevent. Yeah. And is that, is that the same with like, you say like the Afro nasal sprays and things like mm -hmm. that. And those are supposed to like clear up, like you get congestion from a cold and people use it. My grandmother use it every single day. Um, what is that doing to your nose? That's a common thing people use when they have a cold. It's creating a dependency. It will depends on the chemicals involved. If it's a, a nasal spray, that's natural, even the natural products, you'll see that they're relying on glycerin or saline or alcohol to keep it from growing bacteria, to keep it stable and have it be a spray. To be a spray, it has to be watery. And when you spray, I, I hate when I see people use sprays on little ones. And I used to, I thought that was, when I was a new mom, a newbie, I totally thought a saline spray, how can it hurt? I found out through my research that it sends bacteria further up into your sinuses and can cause your sinus infection by blasting the infection, which may be here further up. So Very uh, anything that's a spray, I think is a risk and detrimental, never mind the chemicals involved that could completely sterilize your biome. Yeah. And that's interesting. So you researched that and did a swab um, because mm -hmm. of that instead of a spray. Yeah. Well, I tried to be a neti pot user for a little while and I literally <laughs> felt like I was waterboarding myself. I was just, <laughs> that, was, that was my next question. I was asking about the, the neti potting. <laughs> oh, I'm the worst. I think I had to invent it as a swab. I mean, to be perfectly honest, it makes the most sense, but also I'm a baby. I'm a big baby about sprays and neti pots. I have given it the college try like four or five times. And then every time I'm like, for the love of God, how does anyone do this? It hurts so much. It feels exactly like when your friend dunked you under the water at the lake when you're 10 and all the water. Went <laughs> yeah, <up>. exactly. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, that, that it has its place, you know, like in, for me, when I, in the past, when I would get sick and I, my, my, you know, and sinuses would be full of mucus, I would do that with some colloidal silver and it cleared all the mucus out of your nose. So you're yeah. comfortable, but you, can you talk about how it may compromise your, your microbiome in your nose and cause- Well, with colloidal silver, that may be a little too sterilizing, but I, I'm all for the colloidal silver. I think that's fantastic. The problem is, is that again, it's a spray and it can be blasted up or you have to use it as a rinse, which can inadvertently send infection higher into the sinuses than you may intend. I like to think of things like, um, you know, the guy that does, uh, not bulletproof, no, Mark's Daily Apple. I love his philosophies about grog. What would grog do? And I've employed it through my parenting. What would happen naturally? I don't know that we ever would have forced water up into our sinuses on purpose, but I think anybody could have gotten honey on their fingers and picked their nose. So I like to think of things that would have organically happened to us <laughs> in mother nature. Um, so a swab, a swab makes sense to me. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the colloidal silver? Mm -hmm. And if that's and like fine every once in a while, or do you think it yeah, just I think wipes so. out the, the microbiome? I think if you're fighting a nasty infection that using that in conjunction, if you wanted to use uh, Colby gone with colloidal silver, because the beauty of Colby gone is that it can achieve the antibiotic, the antimicrobial action. Although we make no claims, no curative claims, nothing. I like to say people swear by it and you will too. We keep it real simple because the FDA is very strict about that. But I talk about the super honey. We have homeopathics in the remedy to deal with active symptoms if you're actively sick. But the super honey is on its own. Is an ant super honeys are antimicrobial. They're probiotic. They they provide you with lactobacillus. They're prebiotic. They feed the good bugs that you already have and repopulate. It's humectant. It helps restore and retain your moisture because it, it honey attracts moisture. It uh, opens you to vasal dilator, so it opens you up if you have that non-productive allergy stuffiness, or you're just so irritated, you're swollen shut. Now, if you were to use, if you had a nasty infection going on, I think colloidal silver swabbing it up there, a drop, not something forceful into the sinuses would be really useful in terms of trying to target a, a 
I guess, a per persistent infection, or if you wanted to preemptively strike, if you were exposed and you know, you were amongst a bunch of people that just had gotten the flu or some other, something else was going on, but then use something like Colby gone in conjunction with that, because Colby gone will help replenish and restore the healthy beneficial bacteria that you may have carpet bombed a little bit with the colloidal silver. But I think colloidal silver is the smartest thing you could use in conjunction with it in terms of it being gentle. You know, it does the job without destroying everything. Yeah. And it's just a goal. Yeah, especially if you have a really active infection or you have a really bad sinus infection, it's great. Because uh, not everyone has viral stuff going on. I mean, it sounds like the cold be gone is great for viral yeah. uh, issues. Or bacterial. Most- it's antimicrobial. So it's bi- when it's antimicrobial, it's viruses, bacteria, yeast, mold, fungus, all of that. Although honey does contain yeast and molds naturally, yeah. but it does so without allowing it to proliferate unless you add water to it. If the water activity is low enough and the honey's not adulterated, it can't support pathogenic growth. Okay, great. It may be there because there's pathogens in honey's in the in honey bees' tummies all the time. There's botulism and bee series and all these pathogens that exist in 25% of all honey. And that's why we don't give it to children under the age of one. But a lot of those are working synergistically to almost be beneficial in the way that it works with the enzymatic activity of the honey. And it can't proliferate and make you sick because honey is bacterial static. So unless the water activity changes, it can't grow or harm anybody. Yeah, it's interesting. There's like heavy metals can work in the same way. Like you can have a greens powder that contains heavy metals, but they're so tightly bound to boron, which is in greens powders, that they don't get into your body. They just kind of just go through you. So it's maybe it's kind of like the same type of concept, like honey contains bacteria, but because of the antimicrobial activity in it, that's not going to harm you in any way. Right. And it has to be a certain load. You know, it has to be like 10 million units per gram ingested. And, and so honey is just so stable and, and generally recognized as safe that I thought it's this perfect carrier for the homeopathics for dealing with the really non-productive stuffiness and the active symptoms, what you've, when you've got going, but it's also has its own benefit. So I just don't understand why they have to put so many natural medicines and things that are I think destroy the medicine's benefits or, you know, harm your body in some other way. Honey just made sense to me. And what kind of Manuka honey are you using? Because I mean, I know there's the real Manuka honey is for like, so so to speak, is from uh, New Zealand. Yes. But there's, like you said, there's so many different kinds of honeys that they grow Manuka bushes in Canada and they have them in Australia. Where is yours from? Mine is New Zealand and I work with small hives. And I, I, I work with a homogenator who gathers from the local beekeepers um, and then they homogenize it and they send it to us. They don't heat pasteurize or harm it in any way. It comes to us raw. And that's, that's how I get my manuka. Well, that was my advice from Dr. Molin is like, do not at that time, which gosh, is 15 years ago now, um, there was sort of a Monsanto of honey coming on the scene who was trying to aggregate and take control of all of, yeah, and then trying to grow it and reproduce honey in China. And that's really scary. Yeah. Yeah. There's the Monsanto of everything these days. And he, being the father of Manuka honey, he was so proud of his accomplishment of identifying why so Manuka honey, um, I know you know this, but so stop me if it's redundant or just, but Manuka honey, I'll explain to everybody else. If you have a wound here that's colonized and you go septic and your antibiotics are not working because this wound here, as it's colonizing and sending out the pathogens, they have developed a biofilm around themselves, making it antibiotic resistant. And so when Manuka honey, when the right level of manuka honey, the right appropriately graded medicinal manuka honey is applied to the colonization site, even though you're septic throughout your entire body, suddenly your own body can get ahead of that infection because it inhibits the pathogen's ability to create a biofilm around itself. And you, your antibiotics will start working. Your own body will start being effective, your own immune system. And so it just needs to apply, be applied to where you're colonizing. And that was part of my research. I was fascinated by that. They were starting to use Manuka honey and alginate bandages for, um, field wounds for the military for this very reason for dirty wounds and bacterial resistant infections. So, um, so yeah, I thought that was, that was just amazing to me that there's, 
So Manuka honey, when he identified that methyl glyoxal is the reason Manuka honey can do that, they tried another laboratory, I forget where it was, Germany or somewhere, another scientist tried to replicate it by adding methyl glyoxal to regular honey. But there was some component, I mean, yeah, it worked, but it was still missing something. There was some synergistic magic of the bee saliva with the tea tree to create this bee magic that cannot be replicated in a laboratory. And then there's other honeys around the world, like Scottish Highland heather honey, which is just as antimicrobial as Manuka honey and just as effective against superbugs, but not by the same mechanism at all. And they haven't identified what it is. They still don't, it, as far as I know, as of today, I don't believe they have identified it yet. What was really infuriating before Dr. Mullen passed away is that he's the dude, he's the dude that figured this all out, right? And then the government gets involved and they hire a scientist over here. And that scientist claims that they discovered it and then they patent it and then they get, it becomes regulated and it's just, it becomes a mess. So here he had done this amazing thing and it was sort of stolen from him. Yeah. yeah and it's I, when I was researching Manuka honey, it was fascinating that, you know, Manuka honey kills pathogens in six different ways. That's mm -hmm. why it's another reason why the, this beauty of when people get hospital acquired infections or they get MRSA or they get what, what Marcons or whatever they're, they're getting, um, uh, the C. diff and things like that, you can put Manuka honey on that and if it's antibiotic resistant, you can, you can kill all these pathogens. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's amazing. It's saving people's limbs. And so I didn't understand why it wasn't being applied to respiratory illness. It just made sense to me. It was like, if it's also prebiotic and probiotic and can restore your biome and attract more, it was just sort of made for the nose. All of these honeys are made for the nose, but Manuka honey on its own is really caustic too, especially at the level you need it to be. So the, your nose is a really delicate place. It's like the inside of your mouth, your vagina, your nose, it's all very delicate. And so you got to be careful what you put in there. Yeah. And I, at one point I was, you know, when I got really into Manuka honey is I was taking like a little, you know, half a teaspoon before going to bed even. Yeah. And it, it, I would wake up and have completely fresh breath because it would kill all the bad bacteria in my mouth. And it's, it's incredibly effective. It really is. It's amazingly in fact, you know, I had, my daughter used to eat a tablespoon of Manuka honey every single night of their lives. Cause my girls are swimmers. And when you're swimming, I mean, I'm putting them in chlorine every day, but for camper, my older daughter with her heart, she's so athletic. She's just a beast. I, I couldn't, such a talented swimmer. I couldn't take that away from her as much as I hated putting my child in chlorine every day because that inhibits the biome and it can interfere with your flora. And then my little one, she's a fish as well. So every night before bed, we're working really hard on gut health and probiotics and trying to restore whatever gets taken away through daily living. And I was having them eat a tablespoon of Manuka and while she was doing it, her great teeth. I mean, they both had a few cavities just from the malnourishment of when their teeth buds were formed in Asia, but they generally were doing great. And then when she had her, Invi I had Invisaligns put on her because my younger daughter has albinism, which, so she has a lack of melanin and her teeth are a little bit fragile. That plays into that with a lot of people with albinism have a little bit of a fragile enamel situation. So Invisalign was the best option to get her teeth straightened out. Well, I stopped having her eat Manuka at bedtime and I could see such a dramatic difference in everything, not just her teeth health, but her breath, her um, pooping, like every aspect of this child's health was, was altered just ever so slightly. I had to play catch up all the time at trying to bring her back to homeostasis. And it was such much harder work than it needed to be. So if anybody's got a child with gut issues or anything going on, I think a teaspoon of Manuka every single night before bed is, it's the best medicine there is on the planet, but make sure you get the right Manuka. And that would be Manuka that is rated with the UMF system, which is my favorite. I know there are other systems, but some of those systems were invented by people who didn't want to pay <laughs> to have the appropriate UMF rating system. It depends. Some of them are great. Some of them aren't. I just happen to know that you, when someone's participating in the UMF system, which is Dr. Mullen's original system, I tend to trust it more, but only up to a 16 plus level, anything above 16 plus, then I worry about his cautionary tale of people heating the honey inappropriately.
Yeah, that's really interesting. I wasn't aware of that uh, because yeah, you see ratings like 35 plus and 50 Ooh. plus and, and things of that nature. And they're very, very expensive. They're much, much yeah. more expensive. Um, have you watched The Honey Wars on Netflix? Have you watched you know, that? No, I have not. I have not. It's interesting because before Dr. Mullen passed away, he was talking about how it was striking the Manuka industry and um, that it wasn't featured in the, it's on the Netflix show Rotten. And there's one episode of Rotten that's about the honey wars and how much China has come into the Manuka industry, well, the honey industry in general, and then um, the corruption and how they're constantly trying to stay ahead of it with um, better science and better testing methods. But it's impossible. It's this amazing counterfeiting system that's set up that no one can ever really get ahead. It's almost like the olive oil industry, like there's no one really regulating it. And, you know, there's a lot of you know, canola oil and grapeseed oil being used instead of olive oil. But yeah, it's, you have to just, you know, know your supplier and call the manufacturer and, you know, stick with companies that you trust for sure. But, um, you know, so I think the overregulation has worked against us because I know small honey producers in uh, different countries who no matter what they do, this country wants them to pasteurize their honey to death. They want them to kill the honey in order to satisfy the government to come in under the guise of regulations that they put in to deal with the counterfeiting. So they overregulated to the point of, again, we're getting crap honey. You know what I'm, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I don't think I've seen many products that are like raw Manuka honey. You can see Manuka honey and you see a lot of other types of honeys that are, say, they're raw, like Brazilian rainforest honey and things mm -hmm. like that. But they're, it's like you almost get either or. You know, mm -hmm. I don't see the raw Manuka honey. I think there's a lot that. of fear in labeling and importing right now. There's just... And so what they'll do is overregulate again. <laughs> I would rather t just trust these small, I, you can go now with the internet, we can go find a Brazilian hive and order directly from them. And it is worth every red cent of that shipping to get it from that small batch creator, that hive, than to go buy it here and hope that it wasn't regulated to death and pasteurized on importation. Yeah, well, very, very good point. So tell us like where we can get cold be gone and, and maybe anything else that uh, you want to talk about. Oh, well, you can get Colby Gone at Select CVS, but I would mostly say on our website. That's where you know you're getting the good stuff. It's coming directly from my warehouse, and it is the freshest batches of Colby Gone. Of course, there's like almost no expiration date on these things. It's like four years out, but it lives forever. So I would say go to www.coldbegone.com, and that's B with two E's, or buzzagogo.com, and that's that would come directly through us. We have free shipping. We try to be very competitive with all other online outlets because people are really relying on free shipping and getting things quickly now. So we, we also have bundling and deals. Um, but I think that I would just encourage people to buy their local honey, buy your local honey somewhere in every single state. I believe a super honey exists. If you can find the person who has it and the darker, the better. Yeah. When I went to Kauai, I found this honey at this farmer's market that was just to die for. It was from, you know, the Kauai rainforest and which is like really silky and it was dark and it was just incredible. And you, you, like some of these honeys, you can just feel how powerful and medicinal they are. And it's so, and it's great for allergies too. If you have allergies, you know, get local, eat local honey. That's yeah. one of the get best things you can do. Propolis. Yes. I think if you mm -hmm. can get your hands on propolis, propolis, I think is a lifesaver. The propolis is when the bees, uh, the shortest explanation, how I tell kids about it is uh, the bee, let's say a rat gets into the hive and the rat, they, they attack it because he's going to steal the honey and they kill him. Well, then they have a secondary problem of dead rat in the hive. Rat's going to rot. It's going to destroy the hive. So they go to the trees and they collect the resin and they mix it with their spit and they encapsulate the rat. They mummify him with this tar called propolis, which is so full of beneficial everything on the bioflavonoids, everything that it's, it used to be referred to as Russian penicillin and Russian beekeepers would snap it off and eat it, chew on it when they were sick in order to fight off cold flu, strep, whatever. Propolis is one of, if you can find local propolis or dark pro propolis from darker honeys that are from smaller local hives, that is, I think, one of the most healing beneficial things anybody can do, especially if they're fighting allergies. Did you know that Brazilian red propolis is being studied for small cell lung cancers and all kinds of, yeah, all kinds of cancers. It's just, it's amazing to me how many 
aspects of APA therapy and B products that we are not utilizing in medicine because there's so many. Yeah, I mean, I had this one, uh, this Tasmanian something wood honey that I Ooh. found and it's almost black. It's, it's just amazing. There's so many amazing honeys out there. there and it's kind of like you can go on honey safari. <laughs> it's hard to really? find these different products. Yeah, they should, they should have a honey tasting tour. In New England and Maine, we have a whoopie pie trail. We need a honey trail because I would go and just, you know, there's my Grammy used to, I grew up in Maine and my Grammy was of the belief that dandelion wine cured everything. She was one of those ladies, big old Danish lady and nature medicine was all there was for her. And um, she used to tell me there was this honey up Maine that could cure anything. And she would tell me about it. And I'm like, where I would, where is this honey? So this tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow or two days from now, I'm going to be chatting with this old timer named Holistic Bill. And he's an old New Englander. He's from way up Maine. And I'm going to be like, Bill, have you ever heard of this honey? Because let me know where it is. Somebody up Maine was keeping hives, made the honey that became famous for curing anything in the 1940s. I will find it. <laughs> well, Joyce, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, it was really, really interesting. I think it's important for people to learn about natural products like yours and also about natural products like Manuka honey, which are so, so healing. Uh, that's just, it's at your fingertips. I mean, Manuka honey and your product, Cold Be Gone, is in every store and people should be using these products uh, versus... You know, I think just there's a lot of garbage out there on the market that people need to avoid, including some things from uh, their their doctor. But um, but so thanks for coming on the show. And thanks for having me. Yeah. So everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Myers Detox podcast. I'm Dr. Wendy Myers, and it's just uh, it's such a, a joy for me every week to bring experts from around the world to help educate you and, and give you those missing pieces of the puzzle that you're looking for to upgrade your health. So thanks for tuning in, and you guys. You guys can learn more about my work and about detoxification at myersdetox.com. Talk to you guys next week. The Myers Detox Podcast is created and hosted by Wendy Myers. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Wendy Myers and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.